Well, good evening, everybody. This is Paul Schaus. I'm an optometrist in Tacoma, Washington. I have a practice that uh, emphasizes diabetes, eye care, and education. I'm a certified diabetes educator as well. So pretty much this is what I do all day long is see patients with diabetes and counsel them. And I'm really honored tonight to speak with and present with Dr. Craig Thomas, who uh. will be uh, <laughs> taking over after a few slides on my part. <laughs> Proceed, Governor. <laughs> so I will proceed. Thank you. So financial disclosures, we're, we're, uh, we both have affiliations with different companies. We've done our absolute best to try not to try not and be biased by any of those affiliations. Uh, and if you have specific questions about any of these, we'd be happy to entertain questions in that regard. So we'll start with this premise that diabetes really has reached epidemic proportions in the United States and really throughout the industrialized West and really throughout the world now. You know, North Africa now is the highest, the fastest growth rates of uh, type 2 diabetes in the world. In the U.S., we have more than 30 million people with diabetes. Uh, most of these folks, of course, have type 2 diabetes characterized by <laughs> insulin resistance. About a quarter don't know that they have diabetes. In addition, we have this other huge pool, somewhere between 80 probably 5 million and 90 million Americans that have prediabetes. So their blood glucose levels are above what is considered the normal range, but hasn't quite crossed that quantitative threshold to be identified as having diabetes. We all know that's not really how disease works, right? Your IOP doesn't suddenly cross some magical number and suddenly you've got glaucoma. So really all of these folks, more than 100 million, are on this kind of long dysglycemic road, on the road towards abnormal glucose metabolism and all of the attendant complications. In the U.S., we have almost a million and a half people who are legally blind as a result of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. So a large, large number of patients, still the leading cause of blindness amongst working age Americans is diabetic retinopathy. So, of course, we all know that diabetes causes, you know, a variety of different metabolic abnormalities and all of these kind of work together to lead to eye disease. So of course you have hyperglycemia, really that's part of the definition. Hyperglycemia, blood glucose levels, you know, that are above a certain specified range. But in addition, you get an inflammatory dyslipidemia. So the LDL cholesterol particles get glycated. That is, glucose sticks to the LDL particles, they become small, dense, and highly atherogenic. In addition, hypertension, what we call essential hypertension is really a disease of insulin resistance within the capillary endothelial cells. So we often see hypertension in our patients with diabetes. And of course, there's production of reactive oxygen species, free radicals that damage retinal tissue. And all these things interact with each other to lead to the vascular complications and the neurological complications that we so often see in diabetes. So we know that diabetes causes a whole host of different ocular uh, complications, right? So the the one that we all have seen in our practices probably numerous times are large changes in refractive error. And I've seen it go both more hyperopia, more myopia. I had a patient yesterday with a four diopter shift in his hyperopia. His blood glucose in my office was 713. So that's yesterday. So that's not a, that's not a good introduction to the eye doctor, right? It's, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. But in addition to the refractive changes, of course, we see diabetic retinopathy, but also cataract formation about 10 to 20 years prematurely in diabetes. Glaucoma rates appear to be higher. There's conflict or controversy about that, but you know, certainly neovascular glaucoma rates are higher in diabetes. I think because we're constantly looking at these folks, we may be more apt to diagnose primary open angle glaucoma in them just because they're being observed so often. Of course, you get cranial nerve palsies. But, you know, so three of the other things that aren't really as recognized are ocular surface disease, about twice as common in diabetes. You get what's called diabetic vitreopathy. So glucose mucks up the, uh, the chemical bonds within the vitreous humor, and so the vitreous is more adherent to the retina. And that kind of sets up the, uh, the problem you get with proliferative retinopathy, ripping the retina off the back wall of the eye. And really, what we're going to talk a lot about today, you get deficits in visual function, not just loss of visual acuity, but loss of more subtle measures of visual function. So about 5% of U.S. adults with diabetes have sight-threatening retinopathy, which means either proliferative diabetic retinopathy 
diabetic macular edema that affects the central uh, part of the macula, and the kind of ugly stepsister of all of these, which is foveal ischemia, so loss of uh, vascular, uh, vasculature to the, to the fovea. And so uh, that, that affects somewhere between 3 and 8% of people with diabetic retinopathy. We know that if you improve your blood glucose control, as reflected by your mean glucose, which is the hemoglobin A1C, that you can lower the risk of developing site-threatening retinopathy, but there is no level of A1C or average glucose that is totally protective against diabetic retinopathy. And this is something that I stress to my patients, I'm sure many of you do as well. You can get blinding eye disease even with a good hemoglobin A1C, and you know it's not good, doesn't seem fair from a uh, cosmic standpoint, but a fair number of patients have pretty lousy blood glucose control and don't uh, end up with site-threatening retinopathy. So it's just one of these curiosities of, of care, right? It's like the extended wear contact patient that you know puts the contacts in his or her mouth, right, and never gets an ulcer. <laughs> so we got a we got a couple of poll questions now just to kind of open up the uh, the the thought process and the discussion tonight. So the the poll question is observation of retinal vasculopathy via ophthalmoscopy or fundus photography is the only way that you can detect and or diagnose diabetic retinopathy. So is that true or false? So we'll revisit this question at the end so you can kind of cast your own personal vote. There's there's not a way for folks to vote now, or is there, Ian? Ian's not on. I don't know, Craig. Can we, can our attendees vote? It says yeah, we can. people are voting. <laughs> people yeah. are voting right on, so we'll let them vote. Attendees are voting. We'll let them vote, and then we'll display the responses in just a minute. Yep, and then we have, we have a, a second question, I believe, at this juncture, which we'll put up. So do you want me to to advance to get to the next poll question, or that's under your control, uh, Ian? Uh, no, we're going to give everybody one minute, and that was just up. So let's close this. I thought if I went true-false, we could get fast answers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we had people saying, yeah, so 5% said true and 95% said false. So I'm really impressed with the group. That's awesome. It, it, part of it, it's a definitional issue, right? Is how, how do you define diabetic retinopathy? And so we're going to make the case that it's not only uh, not only vascular lesions that you see in retinopathy, but there's other features that are characteristic of diabetic retinopathy. So we'll go to the next question. So that put me back to the start of our slides. So poll questions, can we? Yeah, so this I think is a good question. Craig, do you want to take this one? Which of the following technologies cannot detect subclinical diabetic retinopathy? Pick one. Which one cannot detect subclinical retinopathy? And of course, that's the operative key word here, right? Is subclinical, which subclinical. yeah tells you that clinically you're not observing the condition. And we're collecting responses now. Give everybody another few seconds. You still there, Paul? I am right on. I'm right here. So just waiting for the like, point. I feel like we're on the radio, man. And we yeah, got we're on the <laughs> Yeah, we, can't, we air, right? can't have dead air, man. I'm supposed to be playing <laughs> something. So, so, where's my gong be all this stuff? <laughs> so there we go. So 2% said OCT can't detect it. 11% said that electroretinography can't. 58% fundus photography, which is really the answer we were leading to because that's, you know, that's a measurement of clinically – uh, detectable, not necessarily obvious, but clinically detectable retinopathy. If you see it on a fundus photograph, you should be able to see it clinically with your fundus uh, biomicroscope examination or even a direct ophthalmoscope. Multispectral imaging uh, was the other one, and then extended color vision diagnostics. So 
Well, we're going to make the case that the right answer here is fundus photography. You can't detect subclinical retinopathy, but you can detect subclinical retinopathy with the other tests that we've enumerated there. So let's see if I can go on to the next slide. We got the poll questions done. Here we go. So this is you, so, Craig, yeah? Here we go. Here we go. So now, and, and, and Paul, you, you know, without almost thinking about it, it was a natural just a few moments ago, you said, you know, so how do we define diabetic retinopathy? What is diabetic retinopathy? Well, what, it, it's come to my attention, and it, it came to me, you know, one of those defining moments in the middle of the, the night, like the light bulb going off. We are, we meaning optometrists and ophthalmologists in this country, we are working under guidelines and definitions that are more than 20 years old. And what we all do now is uh, when we have a patient with diabetes or one that has an established diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, what we all do is we dilate them up, look inside the eye, and we try to see if we can see any diabetic retinopathy. And we're looking for all the standard vasculopathies, microaneurysms, leakage, exudates, edema, all that stuff that you see on the slide. This is what classically, traditionally is called diabetic retinopathy. And by, by definition, by the guidelines that we work under, it is based on the observation of these abnormalities. So if you don't see them, then they're not there. And so it's only by what you see either with ophthalmoscopy or white light fundus photography. Uh, so that's what diabetic retinopathy has been. And in a medical legal sense, what it still may be, it's not what the science says. And we're going to show you what the science says diabetic retinopathy is. But I want everybody to start off recognizing that we've been working under 20-year-old guidelines where the definition of diabetic retinopathy is based totally on what you see. It's based on the observation of vascular changes or lesions. That's a big deal. You see at the bottom of the slide, there's other things that happen uh, with diabetes, and we're going to talk about that. Let's, let's go to that next slide, Paul. And so you see, you know, we say, what is diabetic retinopathy? Well, you got to go, what is diabetes? Uh, you know, the diabetes is these four things. That's what diabetes is. That's how we need to look at it, in my opinion. And you, and you look in the upper uh, uh, right corner where it says retinal vasculopathy. That's the correct term. And those little bullets are what encompasses the retinal vasculopathy. We have been focused like a laser beam on trying to identify or detect these abnormalities in our patient. And if we see them, then we say they have diabetic retinopathy. If we don't see them, then we say they don't. We pat them on the back, say everything's fine. We send some note to the, the PCP and say everything's fine. And everybody thinks everything's fine when it really is not. The second thing diabetes is, if you look in that upper left box, retinal neurodegeneration. And you see what, what characterizes the retinal neurodegeneration, the loss of ganglion cell bodies, and so on. And, and what is significant about this retinal neurodegeneration, and we're going to talk about that in detail, is that the retinal neurodegeneration can exist independent of the retinal vasculopathy. So you can have a patient that has microaneurysms and all this kind of bad stuff that we see, and simultaneously running a parallel and independent course you can have this retinal neurodegeneration where all this other stuff is happening, and one is not connected to the other, and you can have any one precede the other. So a patient can get retinal neurodegeneration, and they can have no visible vasculopathy, and of course you can have the reverse. On the bottom of the slide, you see the other things diabetes is. It is generalized vasculopathy in, in the, the, the renal system, the heart and the brain, and generalized neurodegeneration. And, and, and most of us that have been practicing for more than 10 days have had patients come in, and some, some old lady with diabetes, and you say, Ms. Smith, how are you doing today? Well, I, I got that tingling in my, in my, in my toes, Dr. Thomas. I, I can barely feel my feet. My feet are on fire today, Dr. Thomas. I, I got that, that neuropathy. That's what, that's what they told me I had, okay? So, I mean, I, I mean it's uh, kind of funny because I've, I've heard it so many times, and I just nod in my head and say, yeah, Ms. Jones, you're right. Sure, you're right, yeah. I heard you, yeah. And, and so we know that our patients complain about this, this generalized neurodegeneration where you've got this peripheral neuropathy. Well, what I'm going to show you in a little bit is that stuff doesn't start in the periphery of the body. It starts in the, in the brain. So if you've got peripheral neurodegeneration, well, then you kind of probably have some central nervous system neurodegeneration. And we may use tests to figure out if someone's got 
some kind of brain damage from diabetes. So these four things are what diabetes is. It's not just the, the, the vasculopathy that we should focus on. The retinal neurodegeneration is just as important as the vasculopathy. And the things at the bottom, even though we don't directly impact them, it comes into the conversation and we have to have awareness of them as we deal with the stuff on the top of the slide. It's all connected and you see how there's no up, down, left to right with all the arrows. The arrows are all interconnected because the things are all interconnected. This is what diabetes is in 2017. Let's go to the next slide, Paul. And Craig, I was just going to say in defense of that upper right box, you know, we should recognize that what we classically think of as causing blindness and diabetes is in that upper right hand box for the most part, right? Typically, for you know, the you're, most part. Yes. Yeah, for the most part, the majority of vision loss is, is associated with that upper right box, but all these things are interconnected. But, but what if you've got the other two or the three things happening and you're not aware of them, and, and then the fourth thing sneaks up on you out of nowhere because you didn't see the other two for the past five years? You know, maybe if you had a, a higher index of suspicion and more sensitivity about the other stuff, then the vasculopathy is not going to sneak up on you and you won't have people going blind. Exact point, maybe. exactly. Maybe. Now, <laughs> let's keep going, because see, we're still talking about what is diabetes, what is diabetic retinopathy. Well, really, you know, what we always tell our patients, I tell mine, you know, I, when they, if they ask me, I say, you know, diabetes is a disease of the blood vessels. Now, Dr. Chalice could go on for two hours and explain all the biochemistry and the pathophysiology of it, and I could hang with him, but, but not quite. But I can, I can understand this that I'm showing you, and I showed this to my patients. And so I said, look, you know, we've got technology now where I can look at the blood vessel circulation in your retina down at a microscopic level. I said, and, and diabetes is a disease of the blood vessels, so this stuff's real important. And they'll, yeah, doc, whatever you say. And they're nodding their heads and buying into it. Well, now that we've got technology that can look at the retinal blood microcirculation, and we're going to talk about that, it's, you know, it, I don't see how you can really say you're going to take care of people with diabetes without the technologies we're getting ready to talk about. And you see the, the title of this course, Assault on Diabetes, Assault on Diabetes. There's two ways to assault it. That's why me and Dr. Chaus are giving this lecture together. The first way is you assault it with more information, where the doctor has more information and he, shares, he or she shares that with the patient. And then secondly, to assault this disease Nowadays, you've got to have some modern technology. You, you just can't get it done with your brain in an ophthalmoscope. You're going to miss stuff. And, and so that's what, to assault this disease properly, you've got to be real smart with a lot of knowledge, and you've got to be teched out with a bunch of equipment. And that's what we're talking about. So, Paul, let's keep going on this, this what is diabetic retinopathy, this, you know, this oxidative stress thing. Man, you, you know this stuff like the back of your hand. Well, oxidative stress basically damages the capillary endothelial cells and the pericytes that form those tight junctions that prevent retinal vascular leakage. And so what happens in retinopathy, you get these inflammatory proteins, a whole bunch of them. You get leukostasis or the white uh, blood cells are sticking to the wall of the, of the capillaries, and you get apoptosis, right, this program destruction of the endothelial cells, and the retinal ganglion cells and their axons, axons start to perish as well. So you get breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, blood retinal barrier, you get hypoxia, leakage, retinal neovascularization because of ischemia. So that's what characterizes what we classically think of as diabetic retinopathy. So detecting it, retinal vasculopathy. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. Yes, Go back just one second. I will. This this slide with the fluorescein angiogram. I put this up here. I mean, this is one of my patients. All, all these slides are my patients or Paul's. Uh, you know, I've been practicing 34 years. Back in the olden days, it was like I got a package for Christmas when I would get the report from the retina specialist with all of these fancy angiograms that I had no chance of doing. I kind of knew what I was looking at just because, you know, we learned it. But, you know, when you don't do it, you forget some of this stuff. And I'd get these angiograms, and I'm like, wow, look at all the stuff that my patient has. And it would almost make me kind of giddy. And then I'd like, man, I ought to be able to do this. I actually tried doing it with oral fluorescein. You can never get this image. But I don't know how many optometrists nowadays get these kind of images from their retina specialists when they make these referrals. I hardly make these referrals anymore, so I don't see them. This was probably, what is that, 2013? <laughs> That's probably the last time I sent somebody to get this stuff done. So I just wanted to comment on that as we keep going forward. You know, this to me is passe. The way you detect retinal vasculopathy now 
in 2017, if you're an optometrist, is you start with multispectral imaging. And you see the, the little bullets I've got at the bottom of the slide. And so what we're looking for, you know, we're, we're trying to detect retinal vasculopathy. And, you know, if, if, if we're waiting on the person's eye to start bleeding, before we tell them that there's something wrong with them. I mean, think about how bad that is. What other analogy would we have where, yeah, I'm going to wait till your arm's falling off before I want to do anything about it. Yeah, I want to wait till your eye's bleeding before we start talking about, hey, your eye's bleeding. Uh, why don't we wait? To, you know, we, we should, we've got the technology to intervene earlier. And what I'm looking for now is I'm looking for subclinical retinopathy, which is the, the development of these vascular abnormalities prior to what you can see with your ophthalmoscope. I mean, that's the basic definition of subclinical diabetic retinopathy, is it's all the stuff that's happening, but it's at this microscopic level or deep down in the layers where you can't see it at the surface, but it is there, and it is diabetic retinopathy. So you've got clinical retinopathy, which is what we have been trained to look for with our dilated fundus exam. If anybody's got a, a nice opto uh, uh, instrument, you know, you go wide field, but you're still just looking for the eye bleeding or leaking fluid. You know, it's, it's still clinical, so it's still stuff you can see. It's still the 20-year-old definition. Let's, let's put that to the side, even though, as Dr. Chouse reminded me the last time we lectured, there's still doctors that miss clinical retinopathy, especially if it's out in the periphery. Well, but, there's, uh, you know, that's you not, know, there's that's studies showing for. Yeah. There's studies showing that retinal specialists, if you compare their examination results, identified patients with no retinopathy. If you compare that to an expert reader grading fundus photography, then about 30% of the time the retina specialist does not detect mild vascular non-proliferative retinopathy. I want to make just a quick case for wide field imaging. Really important. The studies coming out of the Joslin Diabetes Center in the last couple of years have shown if you have more peripheral diabetic retinopathy than you do retinopathy in the posterior pole, those folks are about five times more likely to go on and develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So it's really critical you dilate and get a good look at the periphery. And I'm a huge advocate now of ultra-wide field imaging. And we've got a couple of devices out there phenomenally excellent at helping us identify vascular lesions associated with diabetes in the periphery specifically. See, I mean, Paul, the way, <clears throat> the way you're looking at it now, you would almost need to go standard ophthalmoscopy, wide field imaging, OCTA, OCT, and multispectral imaging to do a comprehensive evaluation of your patient with diabetes or diabetic retinopathy. If you want, you to, know, catch, if you want to catch every manifestation, that's exactly right. Every, yeah, if you're going A to Z, don't miss a thing. Uh, including what you would have seen with, a, with an intravenous fluorescein angiogram, really you would see more with that level of intensity, honestly. So let's keep going. <clears throat> so we keep going back to this question, what is diabetic retinopathy? Well, we know that it's a, a vasculopathy, but this, to me, this is all new information. I've, I learned this stuff, you know, less than a year ago. Paul, when did you become aware of this kind of science? Well, you know, so in terms, of the, in terms of the biochemical alterations and all this, you know, probably, you know, a decade ago or so, but every day I learn. I mean, there's studies that come out all the time, a lot of animal models, but we're bringing a lot of this to bear in our patients as well. So it's not, it's, it's relatively new, and I would say the majority of practitioners, including the majority of, you know, ophthalmologists that I know aren't really aware of all the latest breaking science. Well, I got to tell you, man, up until I started doing research for all these presentations, the, the, I... This term retinal diabetic neuropathy, which I've now seen in 12 different peer-reviewed articles now that I know what I'm looking for and how to find it, but I never saw this term prior to six, eight months ago. But now, now that I see it, it's like I keep stumbling over it. So anyway, I want to introduce this term to those optometrists that may not be familiar with it. So what is diabetic retinopathy? Well, we know it's the eye bleed and all that other stuff, but it's also this, this diabetes-induced retinal neurodegeneration, and you see all the things that characterize the condition, this neuroinflammation. I didn't know what this loss of neurovascular coupling was or why it was important. And, and it's important, especially when we get down to some of the tests that we can use to see if anybody has retinal neurodegeneration. And in particular, the electroretinography, the ERG test, uh, picks up this loss of neurovascular coupling. Uh, it just, I found it fascinating, just the science that talked about it. So these things here, these are all these things that make up retinal neurodegeneration, but, you know, it's not stuff you can see. So, I mean, I, could, I can dilate them up, 
get out of my, my ruby land, all kind of stuff. I can't see any of this stuff with the naked eye. So it's, it's a whole different animal. Let's keep going, Paul. So, you know, how are you going to detect this stuff? You know, the, the, the first part about finding a problem is you got to know the problems there. Well, you know, the, the, almost every All Docs member has heard me lecture five, six, seven, eight times, and you know how I feel about OCTs in your office. I, I think that it's really required to have an OCT uh, device to be a modern optometrist and to diagnose and treat disease, really. I mean, I, you know, if we go past, uh, you know, prescribing some patidae for an allergy or restasis for dry eye or something, and, you know, I'm past that, you know, 100 years ago. So if we're going to be real doctors, you've got to have an OCT. And when you're talking about patients with diabetes, the, the beauty of it is that the OCT technology, and I'm just talking regular OCT, not even the fancy OCTA, but just the regular OCT, you can detect the vasculopathy and the neurodegeneration. The vasculopathy, you know, is going to show up as exudates and all the stuff that we're, you know, kind of used to seeing. The neurodegeneration, and, and I, I'm so proud of myself. I actually started talking about this at an all docs meeting uh, when we were at the Broadmoor in Colorado, and I didn't quite know how important it was back then because I started seeing it. What you'll see in these diabetic patients when you do your OCT scan is the sector plots, you know, go red. You know, everything should be green if it's normal. It kind of goes pink if it's elevated, and we're kind of we're trained to look for that pink. We're always trained to do an OCT and see if there's any swelling, any edema. Is the retina thicker than it should be? Well, sometimes the retina is thinner than it should be, and that's a clinically significant finding, and it, and it is a clinical uh, sign of the neurodegeneration. And so I used to see it and not understand the clinical significance. I didn't know what I was looking at and how, and how it impacted what was going on with the patient. And, and I'm really, you know, I don't want to say I'm embarrassed, uh, you know, you got to learn. Uh, but now, now that I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm looking at, it changes so much of what I tell the patient and how I interact with them and help them manage the disease because I'm, I'm coming at them with so much more accurate information and stuff that makes sense. And when I can show them my test results, show them this thing is red, it's supposed to be green, hey, you're losing your vision, your retina's dying, we need to get on it, you got to do this, you got to do that, it's real important. It makes a difference at the end of the visit when I can show them stuff. So everything starts with the OCT as far as trying to detect vascular damage or neurodegeneration. All right, Paul. I just wanted to make you know the case for the importance of inner retinal thinning and diabetes that you will see on OCT. So it's been shown that thinning of the inner retina, so you'd lose ganglion cells, you lose the nerve fiber layer, but you also lose the inner plexiform layer. What you know, the ganglion cell inner plexiform layer in combination are referred to as the ganglion cell complex. So that finding independently of diabetic retinopathy and vision loss, is highly associated with an increased risk of what's called CAN, cardiac autonomic neuropathy. So folks that have loss of nerve fiber layer in their retina due to diabetes or loss of the ganglion cell interplexiform layer complex are four to ten times more likely to have cardiac autonomic neuropathy. Why is that important? Because these folks have a much higher risk of heart attack, stroke and death. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I'm telling you, man, that, like I say, I was almost embarrassed not having these conversations 10 years ago because I didn't understand what I was looking at and the science was not as readily available as me and Dr. Chow's tossing it out tonight. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad about that. All right, let's keep going, y'all. <clears throat> now, we're still talking about detecting retinal vasculopathy. That is, you know, the first primary thing that we do. Uh, again, because we're, we're dilating them up, looking for retinal vasculopathy. Well, okay, fine. What if you don't see anything? What we know now, and, and I think, again, this is a, a non-CE course. I've got all kind of references if anybody wants to see it. But what, what, we, what the science has proven, I've got peer-reviewed articles saying, saying all this stuff. Let's say you line up 100 people with diabetes. Uh, you, you do a dilated fundus exam on 100 people with diabetes. 100 people have normal fundus licking exams. You don't see anything. <clears throat> when you do... An OCTA exam, this new OCTA technology, which you will find 36% of the time is that they have an enlarged foveal avascular zone or remodeling of the foveal avascular zone, which is a finding that is common in people with diabetic retinopathy. So that's not the only thing that would make that happen, but that's the most common thing. Uh, you, the second largest group is you have 21% have capillary non-perfusion. <clears throat> so if you look at that stat, the way I look at it, because it's the way it is. So it's, let's say I've got my 100 patients, and in a busy month, I'll have 100 patients with diabetes throughout the month. 
let's say I don't have OCTA technology, which I do now. I, I got my first OCTA this January, so I've had it for eight months. What I've seen in eight months is that this is exactly true. Uh, so let's say you've got 100 patients, you dilate them up, you don't see anything at all. They look clean as a whistle. You do this OCTA scan, 36% <clears throat> of the time you're going to find something. And what that means is that prior to me getting this technology, what I was doing 36% of the time was making the incorrect diagnosis. I was telling people they were normal when they were not. I was telling their medical doctor they're normal when they're not. Incorrect diagnosis, bad recommendation, bad follow-up. So, so now I, I'm seeing the patient once a year for a VSPI exam instead of every six months for a diabetes, uh, re, diabetic retinopathy evaluation. It's, it's totally different. But the main thing is that I, I have a 36% increase in my capture rate, a 36% increase in the accuracy of my diagnosis simply by adding the technology and getting a little bit more knowledge. You guys can see what the OCTA can show you. So the, again, the, the, the title of the course, Assault on Diabetes. I am now of the opinion, and, and I'm going to shout it from the rooftops, you cannot assault this disease properly. And it's our job to assault this disease. I'm a, we've been assaulting glaucoma for 10 years, okay? I'm tired of that. I'm going to get mad at somebody else. I'm going to go assault diabetes. So I'm going to assault this diabetes for the next 10 years. And the, the, you've got to have more knowledge, but you've got to have this technology to go all out, to max out, where you ain't missing nobody. And then I'll have doctors that say, well, I can't afford that. I, you know, that, I, that thing's too big. I, you, know, you know how optometrists start. They'll give you 10 reasons why they won't do something. And all i got to say is, well, okay, do you want to be a better doctor? Yes or no? Okay, it's up to you. Uh, you know, we buy all these automated phoropters and all this stuff. Do you want to be a better doctor? Yes or no? Uh, the answer is yes. I think you should consider buying one of these machines. Uh, and, and this is why. You know, you got these structure function relationships. Paul, you, t tell them what this is, man. So, so the idea here is that when you get retinal neurodegeneration, you lose visual function. You may not lose visual acuity immediately, but you lose things like your uh, contrast sensitivity, your, your color uh, sensitivity. You lose visual field sensitivity. And so you know, we know that these things are related to uh, diabetic peripheral and central neuropathy, and you also get these neuropsychological disturbances that are common in diabetes. So there's really a whole host of other tests that we can offer our patients with diabetes to assess their visual function. So I'm a big fan, you know, not only of doing, you know, a Snellen visual acuity test, which is, you know, 150 years old at this point, but to look more precisely at patients' color vision to look at their contrast sensitivity. And now I'm doing electroretinography in my office, and I've been very impressed with what it's showing me. In addition, there's some new evidence that dark adaptation is affected by diabetes, that VEP is affected by diabetes. So it's an important concept to know that patients may not necessarily even complain about loss of visual function, but it's demonstrable if you look for it. You have to look for it, though. And it does that, beg the question, is, just back to your point, Craig, I was just going to say that, you know, if you find these uh, OCTA abnormalities, for instance, can we do anything about it? And, you know, the science is new. We don't really know yet. Will really tightening blood glucose uh, control up uh, prevent uh, capillary uh, remodeling in the fovea? So my suspicion is that it will, but we haven't had enough time yet with these technologies. We haven't imaged enough patients to really know for sure. So I just want to make that point that we don't know, but if you have an abnormality, visual function-wise or structurally, I think what you got to do is to go after it the best you possibly can by counseling patients. Well, I know, Paul, if I saw my patients with any of these things abnormal, uh, you know, I'm going to tell them the first thing, the best way to treat it is to not eat that slice of pecan pie. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's going to start changing my conversation immediately. All right, let's, let's keep going. We've been talking about detecting vasculopathy. So we talked about machines that will let you detect vasculopathy. The, the, you know, we could do the wide field imaging going down the periphery. We could do multispectral imaging, looking for microaneurysms, uh, big thing there. We could, we could do OCTA, uh, looking for capillary remodeling. So we're, you know, we're looking for, for vasculopathy, structural defects. Then you start looking for the neurodegeneration. Now, I put this picture up here of a, of a, a VEP testing device, and I know lots of the, the uh, listeners you know, have VEP uh, testing devices, either from Dobson or Conan. And in the course of my research, yet again, uh, like the light bulb coming off, I found just a few months ago uh, this, this reference talking about visual impairment 
uh, not being just you know from the blood vessel, but it also is a neurosensory disorder. So I don't know if anybody ever thought about diabetes, diabetic retinopathy as a neurosensory disorder. And now I've, I've seen a couple of articles talking about this condition called diabetic encephalopathy, where the, 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 the visual pathways in the brain uh, become negatively impacted by diabetes damage, by the neurodegeneration, and their visual acuity goes down. Uh, and it, it's not going to go down from 2020 to 2100, but you may go from 2030 to 2050. Uh, so you may lose a line or two. It's typically something that happens to older people. Uh, most of the patients that, that had this diagnosis were late 70s, early 80s. So you've got to be kind of old and kind of sick, but it can affect your brain. And, and, you know, I've got a large glaucoma practice, just like Dr. Chow has a large diabetes practice. And I don't know about the diabetes patients, but, you know, the glaucoma patients, they seem to forget their medicine all the time. They won't take their medicine. Everybody, you know, they won't use their drops. I've got a lot of diabetes patients. They won't take their medicine. They won't do their pills. They don't take their shots every day. To the point where I'm looking at them like, like, ma'am, are you crazy? You know, is there something wrong with you? You know, you got a little early Alzheimer's. What's wrong with you? Uh, you know, I mean, you, you, your decision making is flawed. And, and we know now, you know, the past 8, 10 years, that glaucoma is a neurogener neurodegenerative disorder where it's affected the brain. It's a brain disease where it kind of messes with the eye. Well, we've got information now showing diabetes is a neurosensory disorder, you know, so it affects everything, brain included, and I happen to have this fancy VEP testing device where I can measure the health of someone's visual pathways in the brain, and if I got some crazy old lady that don't take her medicine, now I'm thinking, man, I wonder if this lady's got diabetic encephalopathy. I want to do a VEP test. Let me see if she's crazy. Because uh, that thing's going to be abnormal if she has diabetic encephalopathy. So yeah, you know, another, you know, another use for me. Dementia rates are two to four times higher in patients with diabetes. And this would be a fantastic way to assess not only the visual system, but the central nervous system in general. I mean, think if you had a lady that did not have glaucoma, did not have you know, conditions that would classically cause VEP abnormalities, and all she had was diabetes, and you saw this lady over you know, several years, and you saw her losing it, you know, kind of losing her decision-making ability, what if you saw the VEP change in two? Man, that would be really important to me, and, and would give me a lot of confidence in what I was seeing and what I was doing. So again, just an application of technology that I already, already have, but I'm using new science, new information that I didn't even know a year ago for a procedure I've been doing for years, and I was like, wow, I've got new knowledge, I've got the technology here, let's put them together, and I can actually get more information and take better care of my patient. So this is another way to detect diabetes-induced neurodegeneration for those doctors that have electrodiagnostic testing devices. And if you don't, maybe it's time to consider, you know, because I'll, I'll talk to doctors and say, well, I don't have any glaucoma patients. All my patients are young. Okay, fine. Uh, how many people got diabetes in your practice? Oh, five a day. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, you know, so you may have five glaucoma patients a month. You may have five diabetes patients a day. Uh, that's what I've seen in lots of practices. So to me, this assault on diabetes, the time is now. Uh, so we're still de detecting the neurodegeneration, retinal neuropathy, and as, as Paul has said and as Ian said, and, and you know, as I've been saying for two or three years, you know, and I've talked to all you guys about it, uh, with all the science shows, is that color vision is just as important and just as diagnostic in some pathologies as doing a visual field test. And you think all the time we spend in optometry school learning about threshold visual fields and Goldman perimetry and this and that and all of that stuff, and then you contrast that with the three days we might have spent learning about color vision out of a four-year curriculum. It's total nonsense. And the modern science shows how important this stuff is and how much information you get from it. Uh, and again, you, you, know, you guys have seen these stats before, me talking about diabetes and how it affects color vision. The big deal is now the technologies advanced to where you can assess the person's color vision with computer-assisted stuff, which is a, a true game changer as far as speed, accuracy, patient buy-in, the vibe, uh, you know, these computerized tests, you know, they, they just eat it up. I mean, people are used to the technology. And, you know, doing a, a D15 or an Ishihara compared to you pulling out one of these fancy computer-assisted tests, I mean, I don't care young, old, rich, poor, black or white, patients notice that and they like it, uh, and they buy into what you're doing and what you're saying when you have advanced technology. So the, the, the color vision is a big deal 
in detecting this diabetes-induced neurodegeneration because I've seen patient after patient where the retina looks normal or you see one or two dot hemorrhages and you almost say, man, I don't even need to do an OCT scan on that thing. I know it's normal. And you do a color vision and one eye's lost half their blue-yellow color vision. And you're like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Huh, I wonder what else is going on. Man, maybe I need to do a visual field in the ERG too. I wonder if this lady's got something else wrong with her that looks totally normal. So, you, got, you know, once you get, I'm like a dog and a bone, you know, once I see one thing abnormal, I'm like, is there something else going on? Did I miss something else? You know, if I didn't do this color vision test, she wouldn't have said, hey, I can't see blue colors real good in my left eye. Would you check that out? Uh, you know, you can't wait for that. So, you know, Paul Chaus and I have been having this kind of running conversation. Do we start testing everybody with every test we got to see if somebody's got something wrong with them? Or do you still have to kind of play by the rules and, and develop medical necessity and put stuff in the chart to create the need to do diagnostic testing legally and, and morally and ethically? And, you know, I'm, I'm leaning towards to test everybody because all I want to do is take care of my patient. You know, I got to follow the rules just like everybody else. We all got to follow the rules and, and we ain't going to break no rules. But the science that we see here and the technology that we have available to us has moved ahead of the rules. And so we're in a difficult position that I don't have an answer to tonight. I just wanted to make the point that there are way less blue cones than there are, you know, the medium and long wavelength cones in our maculas. So they are exquisitely sensitive to metabolic abnormalities. That's why blue-yellow color assessment is really critical in a lot of diseases. And you see in diabetes, this is something that I'm seeing all the time, is blue-yellow color deficits. Me too. How about ERG? Or, Man, or this is this is my this is my newest thing here. So I've I just uh, just like I've got my OCTA this year. I've got my new Anitas this year, and I got this new handheld uh, Red Eval ERG device. This thing is the bomb. I can't tell you how, how cool this little thing is. Uh, I've had it four or five months, and it's 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 so slick because it's so easy, so fast. But the information is just as good as, as coming off one of the fancy, more expensive devices. And I've got both. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the Domsys device. I've got the Conan Evoke DX. I've got this little thing here. And, and it's just as valuable as the others. Uh, I use it all the time. Probably do three or four of these a day because I read these articles talking about how you can find subclinical diabetic retinopathy doing ERGs on people. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to detect retinal diabetic neuropathy, and this instrument helps me do that a lot. Uh, I, can't, I can't really make a higher recommendation. Uh, I'm seeing all kinds of stuff with this instrument. And again, it's so fast. Anybody that has existing diagnostics, whether it's Conan or Diopsis, you know, and they both work. They're both good. I have, I've got them both. Uh, but, you know, the, the slight negative to any standard electrodiagnosis is the hookup. I mean, you know, it may be a 10, 12-minute process uh, to hook people up. Uh, you know, and some people don't like being hooked up, and, and that diminishes the, the ability to do the test, just like some people don't like doing visual fields. Well, I haven't had one person have resistance to this because my staff can get the test done start to finish in five minutes. Uh, you know, I've probably done 200 of them in the past six months, you know, uh, five months. So it's something that I really, really like it. Paul, I think uh, you just got this technology, so you're kind of just getting into it. Uh, but I, I can't give a higher recommendation. This is a nice little thing to really help you take care of your people with diabetes and other stuff too. Uh, but I use it primarily for my diabetic patients. It's easy. It's fast. You know, I, I had fear of, you know, putting something on somebody's face, but it's easy. It's like scotch tape. You put it on, you hook the thing in, less than a minute, you got both eyes done. Patients are impressed by it. And it's revelatory. It shows me people that have retinal diabetic uh, neuropathy. So what is the goal of a diabetes eye examination, right? Obviously, you want to try to find out whether or not somebody has or does not have diabetic retinopathy. And so if diabetic retinopathy is present, you want to know its severity, right? And you want to know, is it purely vascular? Is it purely neurodegenerative? Or is it both? And that's what you're going to see most often in patients is that they have both some level of vascular damage, whether you can see it clinically or not, you know, is, is open, to, open to question. Uh, but neurodegeneration and vascular damage often go hand in hand. Craig, uh, uh, Craig talked about that neurovascular coupling before. And essentially what happens is 
when you get damage to the retinal uh, neural elements, vascular control, blood flow into the eye gets mucked up. So you have increased blood flow into the eye. Totally contradictory to what you would think with diabetes, a disease that you would think would screw up your circulation, but you actually get excessive blood flow into the eye. And that is what leads to pericyte damage along with the biochemical aspects of hyperglycemia. So in addition to characterizing the retinopathy, whether it's neurodegenerative, vascular, or both, you want to exclude, obviously, differential diagnoses. And there's other things that can cause you know, issues with color vision and with electrodiagnostic testing. But you know, if your patient has diabetes, they've got vascular changes, probable that any electrophysiological or other functional tests are going to be related to that. And then, of course, you want to prescribe a treatment program. If the patient has retinopathy, you want to see them more often, presumably, right? You want to, you want to set up a surveillance recommendation based on your patient's uh, gradation of diabetic retinopathy. The worse it is, the more often that patient should be followed. In addition, if you really want to assault diabetes, you have to go after the underlying pathological bases for retinal degeneration. So I talk to my patients about nutritional supplementation, about good diet, about exercise and the like, all the things that we know. And then of course, talk to the primary care physician or endocrinologist about trying to achieve better blood glucose, blood pressure, and blood lipid control. You got to treat any sleep apnea. That's a definitive risk factor for progression of diabetic retinopathy. And of course, when things get, you know, too far along, you got to refer the patient to a retina specialist. For local, what we mean by that is treatment to the eye itself, to the retina itself. My goal is to keep people from getting to that last category. I want to intervene earlier. I want to catch the uh, abnormalities earlier so that I can intervene by getting serious about better blood glucose control, better lifestyle habits. And I'll just tell you a quick thing. And this is something that is shocked me when I went to an ARVO meeting two years ago. The mean hemoglobin A1C is not all that predictive of your risk of developing severe retinopathy. I'll say that again. A1C is not the whole story. In fact, in the, in the uh, uh, DCCT, all type 1 diabetes, the A1C of the subjects in that study, 10-year study, 2,000 patients, A1C only accounted for about 11% of a patient's total risk for retinopathy progression. What's more important? Well, maybe there are other aspects of your glucose levels that are important. So a new study at Arvo, I just read their abstract, said if your blood glucose is above about 200 for longer than six hours, that's when everything goes to hell. <laughs> so even if you normalize the blood sugar after six hours, there is a massive production of reactive oxygen species that persists for the next three weeks. It doesn't happen at three hours, it doesn't happen at four hours, it's six hours. So this is a little pearl of wisdom for your patients with diabetes. If your glucose is above about 180, you want to get it down under 180 as rapidly as possible. Don't linger in the 200s for any longer than you have to. How do you do that? You inject insulin into your muscle, you inhale insulin, you stop eating, you get outside, you start moving your body to get the glucose down. Okay, I digress too much. So for a diabetes eye examination, you know, you want to do a functional evaluation. Part of that's visual acuity, right? Black on white, 100% contrast. I don't think that's enough. So I'm measuring contrast sensitivity in my patients with diabetes. But in addition, a color vision exam, a visual field examination would be one possibility. ERG, dark adaptation, visually evoked potential. And, you know, I threw up their contrast sensitivity because I think it's a really important marker for diabetic visual dysfunction. And then there's the structural evaluation, so fundus photography, wide field imaging. I'm a huge fan of that. We threw in fundus autofluorescence because you might have lipofuscin in the retina with diabetes. Diabetes patients are more likely to get AMD, as it turns out about doubly likely in the ARIDS trial, if you had diabetes, to progress on to advanced AMD. But the other beauty of FAF imaging, it exquisitely shows diabetic vasculopathy. If you have a hemorrhage, microaneurysm formation, it shows up on FAF because it blocks the underlying lipofuscin autofluorescence. You got multispectral imaging. Kerry Gelb of your group has been phenomenal in terms of changing my mind about this. He's shown that if you have subclinical microaneurysm formation, you're dramatically more likely to have insulin resistance. It's actually a test for finding out if people have diabetes. By the time the average patient is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, he or she has already had diabetes about six years 
on average, in about 60% of the beta cells of the pancreas that produce insulin are no longer working. We're catching the disease too darn late. And so that's where we as optometrists can not only identify people with retinopathy, but identify people with diabetes by taking a closer look at the eye. Of course, well, you remember, Paul, I'm sorry. You know, we remember that the, the key thing, we've been waiting for them to start bleeding before we say anything. Yes. It's the same thing. You know, we're, it's a you, say, you know, we're coming in six years late and then we're waiting for them to start bleeding. I think, OCT, I think OCT is really useful in diabetes. I know you can't do it willy-nilly, but I'm doing it on every patient. I'm doing a screening OCT. If I find an abnormality, I have them back for more extensive OCT because about 30% of diabetic macular edema is not detected, not detected by clinical examination by both ophthalmologists, retina specialists, and optometrists. And then, of course, OCTA to see those vascular changes that Craig showed us so beautifully earlier on. The treatment goals, obviously, we want to delay the development of diabetes if we can. 100 million people with prediabetes, we want to talk to those folks about prevention. But if you get diabetes, we want to prevent patients from developing diabetic retinopathy. We want to diagnose the disease earlier, go after diabetic retinopathy earlier. We want to talk to them about their modifiable risk factors, like their medications, like their diet, like their exercise. Are there medications that lower the risk of retinopathy getting worse? Are there systemic medications? There is one. It's been shown in two huge <coughs> clinical trials. It's called Tricor, phenofibrate, triglyceride-lowering drug. You only got to treat 14 patients to prevent one person from needing anti-VEGF meds or PRP. So that's a big deal. That's something that we don't talk about a lot. Motivational interviewing, which is my concept of I want patients to buy into my treatment plan. So what I try to do is to ask my patients, what do you think is the most important thing that I told you today about controlling your diabetes and preventing eye damage? I actually have patients write that down because writing stuff down promotes memory. And then I ask the patient, what's the one thing on that list of maybe two, three things you wrote down that you're willing to commit to doing? That's getting buy-in from the patient. And then I write that in the patient's chart, enter it in the EMR. And I ask the patient about it the next time I see them. So I'm trying to hold them accountable. This has been phenomenally successful for me in terms of getting patients to walk every day, wear a pedometer, commit to walking 8,000 steps a day. I talk to patients about elevating their macular pigment. I want you to take a supplement or eat more dark green leafy vegetables. Let's see if we can get your macular pigment up. So this is a way you can get patient buy-in and see improvements in your patients. Now, of course, we want to prevent sight-threatening retinopathy. So here it, here's that statistic, 30% of retinal vasculopathy is outside the posterior pole, so we got to look at the peripheral retina. And of course, as a last resort, you want to go to these localized treatment options. You know, Lucentis got approval earlier this year for treating any level of diabetic retinopathy. And so, you know, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, if you're going to let people just do whatever the hell they want, it might be a good thing to inject everybody with Lucentis, right? You're going to save money on eye treatments. However, these anti-VEGF drugs are not completely without risk. The more shots you get into the eye of an anti-VEGF agent, the higher the risk of a thromboembolism. Study after study shows there's a dose-response relationship. You want to keep people away from these treatments unless there's no other option. That's my view. This is the study. We got a picture of Craig, but it's the study that I worked on for the last five, six years or so the Diabetes Visual Function Supplement Study. So basically, we took a supplement kind of from ARIDS, ARIDS 2, and we added a bunch of other things that we thought might be beneficial in diabetes based on earlier studies, mostly in animal models of diabetic retinopathy. And what we showed was that taking this supplement, this two capsules a day for six months, compared to baseline, and we had a placebo-controlled group, that we improved significantly people's contrast sensitivity their visual field sensitivity, we did a 5-2 and showed right in the macula, you could statistically significantly improve visual field sensitivity. We improved their color vision, not with the great test that, uh, you know, that, that Conan has now. We used a, a lanthanate, basically desaturated D15, but with that kind of relatively ancient technology, we still showed improvement. We also improved macular pigment optical density, which we kind of used as a marker of whether or not people were taking the supplement because it was chock full of... Uh, of lutein and zeaxanthin. And then really what blew me away is we reduced by about 50% people's high sensitivity CRP, 
high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is a marker of vascular inflammation. So anything you can do to lower that is not only good for the eye, it's good for the cardiovascular system. It's a definitive risk factor for cardiovascular events and death. And so this formula didn't affect people's A1C. You know, that's not the only measure of blood glucose, but it didn't affect their mean or average blood glucose level over a 90-day period. So the idea here is that we were going after diabetic retinopathy and its visual function abnormalities through a mechanism independently of lowering blood glucose levels. This is just a patient from the trial at the baseline had, you know, some non-proliferative disease with some hard exudates, and at the end of the trial, it got significantly better. So does that prove the formula did it? Does this happen on its own? Well, you know, it could. I don't think so. Not all patients had retinopathy in our study. We had folks with diabetes five years or more who got better visual function but didn't have retinopathy either at the baseline or after six months. So it actually worked in both groups. It also worked in young people, <laughs> old people. So we had type 1 and type 2 folks in our study and uh, didn't, uh, didn't experience any adverse reactions. And there you see the CRP reduction, it started at 50%. We did some adjustments because a couple of the patients had were kind of outliers. They had other acute infections that can raise CRP. So at the, at the end of the study, after corrections, it was a 40% reduction in C-reactive protein. But visual field, color vision, contrast sensitivity all improved. We're eye doctors, man. I mean, this is our job is to help people see better. So Craig, you have so this case, case, right? Let's finish up real fast here, Paul. we got three minutes. Uh, I just wanted to show real fast, uh, just a standard case, regular person, 20-year history of diabetes, seeing pretty good, but one eye is not as clear as the other. <clears throat> I don't care how old you are, you know, unless you're 80 years old, then I might care. But, you know, a 66-year-old person should still have normal vision in each eye unless I can explain why. So I, I started running some tests to see if there was something wrong with her, and you see what I did. Uh, let's keep going, Paul. And the main thing I want to show here. Uh, you see the OCTA, uh, you see the left eye, has got some abnormalities down there. Uh, keep going. And I wanted to show this. I still get questions still somehow where people ask me, uh, can you run this test on the same day you do that test? Can, can I do this when I want to do that? Can I, can I do this sometimes on Tuesday nights? Uh, the answer is yes, 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 and yes. <clears throat> and so what, what I did is, what I always do, and you guys have heard me speak before, you know I'm, I'm consistent as the sun coming up. Uh, I ordered a functional vision assessment. I examined her and I ran a bunch of tests, and this is how I reported the service, and I did them all on the same day because I could do it and there's no problems. Uh, we'll go through it again in Hawaii, but, but uh, you know, I just wanted to show you that. This is what the thing looks like as far as a printout. Keep going, Paul. And I uh, use the information to make decisions. So you again, we we go through that. Let's close it up, Paul. We've got uh, what is diabetic retinopathy? You know, is it is it the vasculopathy, the neurodegeneration? And we've got to go past simply dilating somebody, looking in their eye, not seeing anything, patting them on the back, and saying you're okay. See you next time. We got to do better than that. It's time to do better than that. So our answer is that it's both. It's both vasculopathy and retinal neurodegeneration that has to be assessed through techniques we don't always use. So we got the poll questions revisited. So again, and we're back to the, we're to the second question, which is fine. So which one of these things are you not going to find subclinical retinopathy with? The answer obviously is going to be fundus photography because that's clinical clinically obvious diabetic retinopathy. Not always obvious, but it is something that you should be able to detect clinically. We'll move on. Assessing diabetes risk. Whoop, lost the slides there. Got, got bumped out. See if I can move. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm stuck on the poll question. See if I can get my, my screen back. We need a whole lot of prevention, obviously, right? we got to prevent people from getting diabetes. Cornell Medical College has this pretty easy-to-administer six-question survey. Males get diabetes more often than women do. Uh, older people get it more often than people that are younger. People with hypertension get more diabetes. That's why patients are always with type 2 diabetes on, what do we see, lisinopril with their metformin and typically on a statin. Family history is predictive. Exercise or lack thereof is predictive, and, of course, body mass index, really what's important is the central adiposity, waist circumference. We need a whole lot of 
prevention. Macular pigment is one thing I threw in there because that's been linked to an increased risk for diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, probably a function of just poor dietary choices. These are my tips to avoid diabetes. I know Dr. Gelb has his whole program for diabetes avoidance, and I think we agree just on about every single measure. But, you know, all these things have been shown in clinical uh, studies or analyses, observational analyses, to lower the risk of getting diabetes. So you want higher vitamin D, more sleep. You want your house to not be heated up at night. Colder temperatures make you burn more fat. You want to breastfeed, and you might consider fasting. This is something that I've been implementing more and more with my morbidly obese patients uh, based on some real success stories in terms of putting type 2 diabetes into remission. I want to thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Me too. As I always enjoy talking to my all docs brothers and sisters, and I can't wait to see everybody in Hawaii. Can you put me in your suitcase, Craig? I, I'm just thinking about it. It sounds pretty darn good <laughs> to me right now. It's going to be tight in there. I already had a couple <laughs> of requests. <laughs> I got it.